this book right here, uh, Uranium. It says here, War Energy and the Rock has Shaped the World. I'm on page 86 so far, out of around 300 pages. And I've been learning a lot about how this rock has changed the world. A little introduction here on the inside cover, I'll read it to you. The stability of our world rests on a substance that is unstable at the core. This is the fundamental paradox of uranium. The strongest element the earth can yield, and one whose story is a fascinating window into the valor, greed, genius, and folly of humanity. Uranium is a riveting journey to the heart of this eerie mineral. It takes us from slave camps in Africa to desert mesas, war councils, smugglers' routes, doomsday cults, jungle mines, and secret enrichment plants on five continents. In a narrative that is equal parts history, investigative journalism, and nonfiction thriller. So basically what we have here is a book outlining the history of uranium and the fact that at one point what was really shocking to me is it was considered the bad luck rock. It had no value and it was a byproduct of the radium mining that was being done in a lot of the mines. It had no real value because there was no real use for it nor an understanding of what it actually was capable of. The fact that you could enrich it into U-235 and make bombs out of it. Pretty incredible stuff. As well as, you know, plutonium. It says also, throughout a 600 year arc across history, uranium has behaved like a character from Greek tragedy, changing its face almost as quickly as it sheds its neutrons. First a nuance to miners in the Middle Ages, then an inspiration to novelists and a boon to medicine, later a devastating weapon at the end of World War II, and eventually a polluter, a killer, a money waster, an enabler of failed states, and an excuse for a war with Iraq. Another part in here that is not written at all but it has to do with theory development, is since we all know that stars are electrochemical, thermochemical, and basically chemical in nature, that they are not fusion reactors. But I'm looking for, in this book, where humanity and all the scientists have been working on these nuclear weapons and all the propaganda that was aimed towards, hey, this is how stars are powered, where we went wrong in that regard. The fact that everybody believed that this is how stars are powered back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and everybody forced those beliefs onto the stars and the ice sky. They're all fusion reactors. They took a really big detour with that. The stars are not fusion reactors. It was a very big mistake made right after, uh, right after uh, Kelvin determined that the sun couldn't have been shining for as long as the earth had been around. Which should have been, oh wow, maybe the earth was adopted by the sun, meaning the earth is older than the sun. And the solar system slash protoplanetary disk models and all the nebula hypothesis stuff should have came crashing to the ground. But in a way, keeping old, outdated, outmoded, incorrect theories of stellar evolution and of planet formation led to the idea that fusion somehow powers stars when in essence when in essence they don't fusion doesn't power stars the fusion processes happen inside of birthing galaxies where the energies and velocities are high enough anybody can look these up online we have pictures of them now they're called radio galaxies they have a central object and they have two giant beams or jets of energy shooting out in bilateral configurations making giant lobes. You can see these objects, they're called Hercules A, active galaxies, that kind of stuff. That is where fusion is taking place. But since the nuclear age people weren't aware of radio galaxies, they didn't have the kind of technology required to actually place these fusion reactions appropriately. They only did what they knew was best. Place the the uh, reactions where the big hot things were in the universe. So obviously, what's the biggest hottest thing we can think of? 
when we step outside on a clear day. The sun, they place it right where it doesn't belong. They, uh, I don't know if the concept of the red herring plays into this, but fusion inside of stars is a red herring. It's never going to work. You need the velocities high enough to cause fusion reactions. And those velocities only exist inside of birthing galaxies. You cannot do it with really hot material. Hot fusion isn't the future. It's high velocity fusion is the future. Um, so in essence, I guess the LHC is doing some kind of work in regards to you know, high velocity reactions, but all their quantum and particle stuff is nonsense. I guess you could say it's like an experiment they're doing where they have to pay attention to other things, but they're not paying attention to the right stuff. It's kind of weird how that works. But anyways, here's a, uh, here's a good book. I'll show you again. Tom Zollner? Is that how you pronounce his name? Not too sure. But I suggest taking a look at this book, reading the history of uranium. And I think it's really funny how uh, in the beginning it's like this uranium stuff is worthless. It only is used to color glass or make interesting, you know, artwork or something. But that's about it. Its real potential was never realized for hundreds of years, even though it was all over the place. And also, I want to read this book to see how powerful mainstream ideas can become to skew the public's imagination into wherever it is their governments want their imagination to go. I'm just starting to read a little chapter here. Let's see, what is it called? On page 86. Yeah, the... Uh, the guy that was in charge of all the propaganda for communicating between the government and the public, Lawrence was his last name, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E, William Lawrence. He had changed his name, obviously, when he came back and he gave his first name William uh, in honor of Shakespeare because he was obviously a, you know, a journalist. And he got to see two uh, atomic explosions himself and even you know, explained a lot of the processes to people in the public's eye, and well, when he went to Leslie Groves, Groves had either the option of shooting him or hiring him to do this uh, outline of what was happening with the atomic weapons to the general public. So Lawrence had a lot of power in that regard as well. He probably could have repeatedly claimed that the sun was a fusion reactor, yet that is completely bogus bullshit. The sun is not a fusion reactor. The fusion process is happening in birthing galaxies. Of course, I don't think he would have known that by now, given the supposed experts at the time, Enrico Fermi and the others, just simply were obsessed with neutrons and how they could collide and how they could manage to vaporize hundreds of thousands of Japanese human beings. Uh, human beings, I shouldn't say Japanese. This is a human problem. But anyways, there's a, lot of, there's a lot more information in here. Way too much for me to go over into a short video, but I just wanted to tell you guys what I'm reading. I'm looking for the giant mistakes and red herrings and where we went the wrong direction. Alright everybody, today is October 25th or 26th, I can't remember. 2015. Later.